Hi folks, if you're just joining me, this is chapter two of a playlist detailing the design, installation, and performance of a data logger for an environmental monitoring experiment in Mission Gardens here in Tucson, Arizona. In this chapter, I'll provide an update on how the data logger has been performing and then go into a few more details regarding its design. Let's start with my most recent visit to the site since its formal deployment on September 25th of 2025. All right, folks, it's November 26th, the day before Thanksgiving, and uh, we're gonna see how the data logger's been performing uh, these past few weeks. So it looks like they went ahead and they harvested whatever they had. I wonder if that made any kind of impact on uh, the monitoring, but everything seems to be okay. Nothing seems to have been disturbed, which is great. Let's go ahead and open it up and download the data and see what we got. Go ahead and shut it down. It's off. Let's take the card out. Should probably have a pair of tweezers here to make this easier. Okay. Looks like we have a fairly sized document, which is promising. Yep. We have data all the way through 9.57. The download looks fairly good with nothing odd in the data aside from what appear to be a few resets taking place on October 12th over the course of an hour, as evidenced by the logger writing several new header rows. Considering this is the only anomaly realized over the course of two months and close to 9,000 records, I'm pretty happy with performance, but to double check, I ran some basic statistics on the data, which in turn showed nothing anomalous, as well as strong overall power performance. Here's the diurnal voltage record showing nothing anomalous outside of a slight increase in voltage during the period when the system encountered a few resets, from which it promptly recovered. The battery voltage likely spiked as a result of the system being intermittently down over the course of an hour resulting in the battery rusting and charging above normal. Regardless, nothing shows up in the data suggesting temperature data was biased over time. The same can be said for humidity, which did come in at 100% during a few days when we had some nice rainfall. And here's that temperature and humidity data superimposed, showing a temperature drop during that period of increased humidity when rainfall was present and as you would expect. That was a good period of time to have this undisturbed and left running on its own and we didn't have any issues. So it seems like the design is pretty good. So I'm going to format this. I'm going to reinsert the card. We'll reset it. All right, the card's been reinserted. Let's turn it on. And I see data on the screen. I can't read it because I need to replace this, but it did fire back some information which suggests that uh, everything's working okay. One thing I like to do before I leave is I'll leave this little adapter behind uh, for that small SD card in case I forget one from home. And there's also a backup SD card in there in case something fails with the one that's currently installed. So we'll just leave that right there. And we're good to go. So let's go over the data logger components, starting with the solar panel. The one shown at the start of the clip is a 6 volt, 6 watt panel, which is what I happen to have on hand for testing. But the one being employed at Mission Gardens is actually a smaller 6 volt, 3.5 watt panel, which works quite well in Arizona, where we have plenty of sun. The panel is attached to this solar LiPo charger inside the box. This combo keeps the battery voltage topped off for powering the data logger and its connected sensors. In order to hook up the solar panel to the charger, I had to purchase this DC jack adapter cable since the barrel jack on the panel is smaller than the one on the LiPo charger. As for the battery, usually I can get away with a 2200 milliamp hour LiPo battery, but for this installation, I went with a 6600 milliamp hour battery since I won't be nearby to monitor and replace should we have several days of clouds contributing to a dead battery. 
This larger battery can keep the system running for a few days with no sun, making it a good alternative for remote deployments. In my box, the battery is hooked up to the LiPo charger via the JST plug on the charger labeled LiPo. I then connect the additional ground and LiPo pinouts from the charger to the power rail of an Adafruit half-sized protoboard. Now that the protoboard has power, it's been amended with some JST connectors, which make it easy to hook up and power additional components as needed. Next, let's take a look at the data logger itself, which is powered by the energized protoboard. The data logger is made up of three components, as shown in this photo. The primary hardware is an Adafruit Feather MO data logger, which is a relatively powerful microcontroller with plenty of memory to host various sensor libraries, and which also has the capability to write data to an SD card. Since the Feather MO data logger doesn't come with a real-time clock, I've stacked a DS3231 Precision Real-Time Clock to help me timestamp any data collected by the Ada Logger. Note that Adafruit does sell an Ada Logger feather wing that includes a PCF8523 Real-Time Clock on board, but my own experiments show that the respective clock loses time, so I prefer to use a Precision Timekeeper for remote scientific experiments where I won't be available to check and adjust the clock due to time loss. The DS3231 is a great alternative. And just a quick side note, if you'd like to learn more about my data logging experiments, please see my video entitled Logging Weather Data with an Arduino Microcontroller, where I do a deeper dive into the use of various boards and clocks and recommendations that came out of those experiments. On top of the Ada Logger and RTC, I've stacked a Feather OLED which can visually display real-time data. These are quite convenient, but just a heads up that based on my own experience, these do degrade over time, perhaps due to our hot climate here in the Arizona desert. Finally, all these components are stacked on a Feather terminal block breakout, which makes hooking up other components quite easy via the use of a small screwdriver, thus avoiding unnecessary soldering. Now let's pivot to how we'll attach the I2C sensors for measuring air temperature and humidity. The design I'll share here has a few upgrades from prior installations, beginning with this little I2C booster, which should help avoid signal loss over long wired distances when communicating via I2C. And as you can see here, I've mounted this little booster on a second Adafruit half-sized protoboard. And again, to make things more modular, I've added some Ethernet connectors for hooking up multiple I2C sensors via Ethernet cables. In the case of my current installation, I only have one sensor connected to the rail. Here you can see the backside of the protoboard showing how one rail is used as a surrogate for power to the I2C extender, and the second rail is used to combine all the I2C pins together all of which are connected to the appropriate pins on the I2C extender. As I'll show in the next slide, the power rail of this protoboard is connected to the power rail of the first protoboard, and the I2C rail is connected to the data logger via the screw terminals on the feather terminal block. To demonstrate, this image shows how the VIN and ground from the sensor protoboard is connected to the power rail on the first protoboard, and how the I2C rail from the sensor protoboard is connected to the SCL and SDA pins on the data logger used for I2C communications. The sensor I'm using is the Precision HDC3022 temperature and humidity board, which again, to keep things modular, I've mounted on a little quarter-sized protoboard. And again, that little sensor protoboard is mounted in this homebrew radiation shield whose build I summarized in a prior video. If we peek inside the radiation shield, you can just barely see the mounted protoboard and sensor. Taking a closer look, the temperature humidity sensor is being isolated with a small scrap of recycled packing styrofoam to help minimize bias in readings from the housing heating up. You can see that I've also added some space around the mounted sensor on the next stack plate to avoid bias in my readings. Again, additional details regarding the build are in the first chapter of this playlist. 
If after watching this, you're interested in building one of your own, I've included a link in the description that shows the most important components you'll need for the same. Coming in at around $200 if you purchase from a reputable online retailer like Adafruit. When you consider that commercial alternatives can cost hundreds to thousands of dollars more for a less customizable solution, this is a viable alternative for folks who enjoy making and deploying their own installations at reduced cost. In a future video, I'll start going over the code or the software driving the logger. And I'll also talk a little about these terminal blocks for attaching multiple DS18B20 temperature sensors for soil and air temperature monitoring, which will be integrated in covered and shaded plots this spring. I hope you enjoyed this video. This project is going to be ongoing for some time, and I'll be using YouTube to document developments and lessons learned as we start adding more sensors, updating the code, and collecting data in support of the experiment. Please consider subscribing for updates, and if you like this content, please give me a thumbs up, which helps get the word out about my channel and this free resource. See you next time.